Bom, gente, boa tarde a todos. Acho que agora está tudo ajeitado, então a gente vai começar novamente com um pouco de atraso, mas com a mesma empolgação de antes. Hoje à tarde a gente vai assistir a palestra da arquiteta e professora Emily McClone, que é professora associada da Faculdade de Arquitetura, Design e Construção da Universidade de Auburn, no Alabama, Estados Unidos, e ela, na verdade, trabalha numa, no, campo externo, no campus externo, né, ou numa unidade externa ao campus, que é o Rural Studio, fundado em 1993, se não me engano, e que faz uma espécie de programa de residência externa à universidade. Numa conversa recente, ela me contou que ela própria se formou em arquitetura nessa universidade, também fez essa residência e agora está como professora é, nesse lugar. É, a ideia do Rural Studio é uma inserção dos estudantes na prática direta e que ao mesmo tempo é articulado com uma comunidade muito pobre, ela vai nos contar bastante a respeito disso e eu chamo atenção especialmente para um programa recente que eles estão fazendo de casas acessíveis, mas que também sejam replicáveis, né, ou que possam ser multiplicados em escala. Enfim, então, é, para todo mundo... Existe, existem dois canais que quem quiser escutar a apresentação na tradução e para português, feita pelo Guilherme, gentilmente e competentemente, só apertar o botãozinho aí da interpretação. E depois a gente vai ter uma sessão de perguntas e respostas, e perguntas podem ser encaminhadas pelo chat ou no próprio chat do YouTube, quem quiser também formular as perguntas ao vivo, pessoalmente, é, fique à vontade. Então, Emily, bem-vinda e muito obrigada pela sua presença. Thank you, guys. I'm happy to be here. Um, I uh, thank you all for inviting me, of course, and um, I would much rather be in Brazil or sharing with you live, but Pretty, I think it's pretty amazing that we, I can do this directly from Alabama. So I'm going to share my screen now so you guys can see my presentation. Let me make it to full screen. Okay, so you should see, um, you should see a black dot with rural studio written in it. And I'm going to, uh, be aware that there is a lag between slides, so I, I won't go too quickly, but I do have a lot of images to share mostly with you today. So um, let me start. Okay, here we go. All right. Yes, as Silky said, um, the Rural Studio is part of the architecture program at Auburn University, which is in the state of Alabama in uh, the southern part of the United States. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And uh, we are mostly, actually all undergraduate um, students now. We had, for a short time, we had a graduate program, but the pandemic has put that program on pause, but um, I won't talk too much about it today. Uh, what makes our program unique though, is that about this many students, so I'm looking at a slide now of our first day of class underneath one of our big outdoor pavilions. And each year, about this many students moves two and a half hours away from main campus out to Rural Studio, which is in rural West Alabama. And um, what makes this program unique from other uh, uh, architecture programs? Well, first of all, it's fully immersive. So the students move and live in rural West Alabama, but they actually get to build the things that they design. Most of you, if you are uh, here a teacher, you might wanna know how this works within our program. So Auburn's architecture program is a five-year professional bachelor's degree. And the students from the third year and in the fifth year of study are the ones who come out to um, study with us in, in Hale County. So the, in the third year of study, it's their study abroad year. So we have programs that go to Rome and they go to Scandinavia 
and to a new program to Barcelona, Spain. So you can kind of think of the, the third year program as a study abroad trip to West Alabama. The students go back to main campus where they do a comprehensive final or fourth year project. And then they apply to become students in their fifth year where they do larger projects. Most of them are community based and they work on smaller teams. And those students come out for nine months, so, or more, more than that. At the Rural Studio, the, the, what it looks like, the, I get about 10 to 16 third year students each semester. So the fall and the spring, I have two different groups of students. And then my colleague and the director of the program, Andrew Freer, he gets between, between 10 and 12 students also, and they divide into teams of four. And they are there for quite a bit longer. So um, there, it's an it's an it's an academic year that they officially spend. But sometimes the projects tend to go a little longer than expected. So we call them super thesis or leftovers. And most of our students are dedicated enough to stay in complete projects that are taking longer than the academic year. So this program uh, was started by a man named Samuel Mockby. He's from Mississippi, which is the neighboring state to Alabama. He's an architect, but uh, this was about 27 years ago that he started the program. He passed or um, he died in 2001. And since then, our director is, has been Andrew Freer. So the, I think the most important you know, thing to say on this slide is that we are, place is very important to us and we are fiercely place-based. So um, it's very important for the students to become part of this um, different community from where they're, where they're from. And, um, and it's very important that we've been here for so long. I think that that's why we're able to do the things that we do. So here we are, in case you aren't familiar where, with where Alabama is, I joke that some people from our own country don't know where Alabama is, but we're, there we are with the yellow star. And then when you zoom in, um, you can see this, the outline of the state uh, where main campus is on the east side of the state. And we're based about two and a half hours west um, in a little town called Newburn, which is this image here. There's about 300 people that live in this pretty, um, this very small rural community. And like most other American small towns, We've lost our population because um, there aren't many jobs here. The schools aren't that great. And actually, our, we, the schools that we do have are consolidating to bigger cities. So we don't have local schools anymore. But uh, those are all, th all of those things sound negative. But the people who live here are very proud. And we're very proud to be a part of this community. Um, this is just a little context about where we are and why it's important. We're very remote, um, like you can see from the map, but architecture school in the design phase is quite a bit like all of their architecture programs. The students work in iteration and they do presentations and they get feedback from their professors. And we have a whole host of guests that come to visit us to give us um, feedback um, about our projects. When my students move to West Alabama, they live in these little structures that we call the pods. And there's about two that live in each house. So not only are, do we become part of the Newburn community, the students also create their own community. At Halloween each year, uh, we do a big um, dress up Halloween review where the students all have to make a costume and very serious, it's, it's a, it's, it's a fun event, but, um, and we do present very serious work to our reviewers. But I think the point is that I'd like for you to know that we also don't take ourselves too seriously either and that we try to have a lot of fun. This was Halloween two years ago. Um, we have a, we're lucky to have a post office in our town. That's kind of the heart of a small community, being able to mail um, and get mail, and we also have a mercantile, which is a, you can, at least you're able to get a, um, a six pack of beer 
right there or you know a coke or a snack or something in our town um you know so one of our assets really is our history in this region so this is Teresa Burroughs in this slide and she is one of our clients and she was also a civil rights protester during the civil rights marches um, in the you know in a, the civil rights movement in the United States so there are some other very familiar places on this map I imagine if you know anything about the civil rights movement that Selma Montgomery and Birmingham were uh, really important uh, places of protest and for community um, and Dr. Martin Luther King is on the right there and the the project that we were able to complete for Mrs. Burroughs was the Safe House Museum. So this house that you can see on the in this slide this is what it originally looked like before we um, renovated it. What's important about this house is that um, Martin Luther King sheltered here one night when a mob was looking for him. So it holds great importance in the in the Greensboro community around Depot Street. So the students in this particular project, uh, it wasn't really about redoing or making this project look uh, or these houses look different. It was really about cleaning them up and, um, and respecting them as they were and to preserve their history. So this type of house, we call this a shotgun house, which is just a long, narrow, it's a series of single rooms. It's just a, it's a local typology. And both of these houses were connected by this breezeway that um, allows the, the visitor to kind of march um, with the protesters. A lot of the materials, you know, we didn't, again, we, we didn't try to renovate or recreate we just kind of cleaned up to respect the color palette and the materials that exist in this particular, um, this house. So now the, um, this museum is, it's, a, it's of course a museum. It explains the history of itself, but it's also a gallery and a community center where um, people are able to meet and uh, they have art exhibitions and it's just, it's, it's, it serves as a community center as well. Each one of our projects, when the students complete them, you won't see many of these pictures, but we do have a ribbon cutting and a celebration to, um, to celebrate the students work and to celebrate our clients. So in beginning to recognize our past, which is what I think the Safe House Museum um, does, a, you know, the United States, we're, we're, we're just actually kind of starting to recognize the, the, the past from the 1950s with the civil rights and memorializing and creating historic landmarks for all of the protesters and people of the civil rights movement. So, but in, so part of beginning to recognize our past is that the injustices uh, have left their mark in more than one way. Um, a lack of opportunity in our region has you know, fostered or created um, poverty. So in the United States, about 14 and a half percent of the population live at or below the line of the U.S. established line of poverty. And in the state of Alabama, it's a little bit higher at 18 percent. And in our county of Hale County, which is where we work the most, we're at around 27 or 28 percent. So you can see that we are in a, unfortunately, a, a lot of our, um, the people, you know, our neighbors live in, in a hover around the line of poverty. So it is one of the reasons that the rural studio is here. Uh, we, we like to think, or the way I like to describe the rural studio is that we, we aren't here to save anyone. Everyone here in our region is very proud. They work very hard, but we make the spaces for conversations to happen so progress can be made. It's not our job to, to, um, to change anything. It's just the architect's job and the architecture student's job to make those spaces so everyone can move forward together. Uh, it's a very religious part of the country. Um, most people go to church uh, and um, 
And, you know, it's also very, like most rural places, it's also very agricultural. So I should recognize that a lot of the wealth, you know, where there is poverty, there is usually great wealth. And because the, the haves and the have nots are um, extreme. So we should also, we have to be able to recognize that the great wealth in our area was built by a few and, you know, on the backs of many of the uh, injustice, the unjust practice of slavery. So, um, so cotton was, you know, that's kind of a, we're known for that particular crop. Uh, and we still do grow cotton sometimes here, but we also are cattle farmers and we're catfish farmers. So a lot of the land has, um, you can see in the top right image is someone seining a catfish pond, which is just a type of freshwater fish that they grow and they harvest here. And Greensboro is the, which is the, the biggest town north of New Bern, the catfish capital of Alabama. Um, you know, the evidence of this unfair wealth is really all over. Um, it's aging, but these houses, which are called antebellum homes, which are pre, they're houses built before the American Civil War. Um, and although they represent, you know, what I've been speaking about, and you know, this great wealth and this great poverty and a pretty um, nasty past. We do, we are able to learn a lot from these particular buildings. Their building practices, uh, you know, they're built of wood. They have um, quite efficient natural ventilation, great daylight. So we do study the past for those reasons, for the functionality of the, um, of the buildings. We don't only study the big magnificent mansions, we also study the simple buildings too, like these barns, which are quite beautiful in our area. Our area has a rich tradition of making. So Rural Studio, uh, we aren't the only makers in our area. These are quilters. We have a pretty famous quilters guild south of us um, called the G's Bend Quilters. And these, uh, these particular women make beautiful quilts, you know, very abstract forms and have been doing this for, you know, over a hundred years. They look very modern, but these are actually pretty um, old quilts, old designs. We have artists that work in our area. This is Amos Kennedy. He's one of our partners, has been in the past. He makes uh, wood block prints like these on the screen. And he's uh, done workshops with our students. In fact, we've had quite a few local outsider or artists or um, folk artists work with us in the past. This is Charlie Lucas. He's also known as Tin Man, and he makes sculptures out of old, you know, uh, rusty parts of cars and pieces of metal that you might think are, are scraps, and he makes these pretty amazing sculptures out of them. Another influential artist in our area is a na man named William Christenberry. He's a photographer and a sculptor and his work was to photograph old barns and buildings like these at, through time to show um, really I think that instead of showing the the people that use them it's showing the humanity um, and people caring for things that might seem like they have very little value but showing the, the love through the love of those buildings through the photographs. Um, what's I think is also significant about some of William Christenberry's photographs, uh, like the image on the left, that's a Christenberry photograph from, um, from the 1970s. Uh, the image on the right is one of our clients from around 1996. So that, that, was, that was some years ago. But I, the point I'm trying to make is that some of the, some things that you might think are out of date or you might not see anymore, it's actually still possible to find places like this. And this is how Rural Studio gained its start. Uh, Samuel Mockby, the first buildings that he created were houses for, um, for individual families. So if you have followed the Rural Studio at all over the course of the last 27 years, you might be familiar with this house. It's called, we call it the Haybell House, uh, and it was for the Bryant family. And these houses are, you know, quite unique. They're beautiful. They are made of unique materials. 
but they're really not affordable. You would never be able to build more than one of these, um, you know, because of the, the unique character of them. And they're also built of materials that you might not be able to find ever again, such as the smokehouse here, which is built of old pieces of the sidewalk from uh, Greensboro when they poured new concrete sidewalks. And, and if you look in the, at the ceiling above that beam, you can see that the roof is made of old road signs that were you know, donated. So these, these buildings are beautiful and they're iconic, but they're not replicable. So um, at the end of this presentation, I am gonna go through uh, how we've evolved and um, from the, the housing that we did at the beginning to what we're doing now. Most this is the butterfly house. There aren't any particularly strange materials in this house, but it does have a pretty magnificent front porch, so you can uh, the family can live on it. Um, you know, I the first part of my presentation is really it's more about context. I showed you a couple projects, but I want you to understand kind of where we're working and why our place is so important to us and to the architecture. But uh, to be clear, what I also want to, uh, another point I really want to make is that our first priority is to teach architecture. We um, operate in this place that benefits from our critical thought and all of the energy that the students bring. And we try to provide appropriate and more affordable places for people to live and gather. So it's a mutually beneficial relationship to work in West Alabama and for architecture students to learn about construction. Uh, the community projects that we work on are really the main focus of today. And this is a pretty important um, uh, community project. This is uh, what we call the, um, the glass chapel. And it's called the glass chapel because the roof of it is made with um, many, many car windshields that the students um, gathered from old cars from junkyards. And it's really, it's also a rammed earth structure. So it's the local red earth mixed with cement and an aggregate It's packed in forms. This is not a new material. It's just very rarely used um, in, our, in our part of the country. It's more of an arid climate building material. And this is the chapel that the students built. Um, and this is what it looks like now. So why, you might think, why would she show a picture of uh, one of their projects that um, isn't successful. You might say it's not successful, but I actually think that it is a success in a learning environment because we, the other point I wanna make is that we learn from our mistakes. The mistake that we made in this particular project is that we did not build for a client. We, we, built, we built in a neighborhood, we, pro we gave the people of this neighborhood a, a, a chapel because we thought they needed one. No one ever asked for this building. And so when people don't ask for something or don't need it, it they don't know how to take care of it. They don't know who it um, belongs to. And when things are made of such strange materials like car windshields and rammed earth, no one knows how to care for it either. So this is, I think, one of, after being somewhere for 27 years, one of the greatest things, great, our greatest assets sometimes are our mistakes that we've made. We, um, so that being said, one of, you know, we always look for clients. We look for community groups and clients who need, uh, who are asking and who need, a, you know, a particular space. So this is the Antioch Baptist Church and they were worshiping in this little building um, that was you know, almost falling down and they needed, needed a new, church. So the first thing the students built was this very small temporary church so the congregation could keep worshiping while the new church was under construction. I like this project um, quite a bit because the northern side, which is the, um, which is the side opposite of this uh, image here, I'll show you in this next slide, the northern slide is through, the northern facade is um, beyond this glass that's um, on the right hand uh, side of this image. 
and I like it because the church is kind of buried into the ground and the cemetery is directly adjacent to it. You can't really, let's see if we can flip back to see the cemetery. Yes, you can see it in this image. You can see the graves and the headstones and the way that they've situated it in the landscape, the, you know, the people who have moved on before the people who are still worshiping, they still have a place in church. I think that's a really, it's quite beautiful metaphorically and also just it's a it's a nice it's a nice way to worship and come to church um in this community project we this you know what each one of our projects are uh we study the place extensively so this is perry lakes park which is in a neighboring county and uh what's significant about this park is that it is surrounded by swamps that um, are adjacent to a, a river that flows through. They're actually called oxbow lakes. And we work often before any construction begins, we, we, we do mock-ups. So we, do, uh, we test ideas at full scale to make sure they're working before we proceed with uh, construction. So four students built Perry Lakes Pavilion. Here it is finished. And because it's so close to the river and to the swamps, this whole area floods. So you can see there's a little bit of water in the foreground there. And that's why the, the deck of the pavilion has been raised. The students cut down and milled all of the lumber for the, the platform. And um, uh, what I, my favorite part about this particular project is, can you see the footings that the columns rest on and how they're square? I, I um, Can you see the, the texture in them? They kind of, they look like uh, tree stumps that were maybe there before the students found this place. So they really, I think, tie the pavilion literally and figuratively to this particular park. They, they lined the formwork with the bark of the trees that they milled, and that's how they got that texture. This park is a four-part project. So the next part of the, the next project that was completed was down this boardwalk, and four students built these four amazing restroom or bathroom experiences. So when you invite people to come have a picnic at a pavilion, the next thing you have to provide to them are bathrooms. So uh, this is the tall toilet. It focuses and looks up at the canopy. You can see the toilet down here in the bottom, um, circling. Uh, this is what we call the long toilet. It's views of the tree trunks, and that's from inside on the toilet. And then the last toilet we call the mound toilet, and it's actually buried into the septic mound and looking down a fire lane through that view there. Um, the third part of this particular project, or of Perry Lakes Park, is a bridge. It's a three, um, it's a cantilevered bridge. It's a covered bridge, and it's in, built in three components off-site. So the students built these three trusses and then we trailered them in, we hauled them into the park and then we hired a crane to lift them and put them into place. I, you know, this, this project is, um, I think quite beautiful because also of the materials that the students picked. Um, the roof metal that covers the bridge is made of an old barn, like the, the metal from an old barn. So it really blends into the landscape. And the walkway in this project is actually hung from the trusses. Normally you um, walk on the truss, but the walkway is hung from the trusses in this tr project. We worked with an engineer named Joe Ferruja. He's from uh, Chicago. And Joe had, helps us out on all of our projects when we need engineering work. All of our projects go through an extensive engineering process before the students are able to build it. Working, and the students do all of that work. And so the fourth part of Perry Lake Park 
is the birding tower. So um, if you're not familiar with what birding is, um, it's a hobby and people climb and watch for birds, all different types of birds. And a swamp is a really good place to watch birds. So it's actually, it's a tourist attraction. And one of the challenges for this project was how to, how, how were the students, you're able to see more and interesting, more interesting birds, the higher you climb in the tree canopy. And, um, but we ourselves didn't really have the capacity to build a very tall tower. So what they did was buy this old fire tower for $1 from the state of Alabama. And they went to Texas and they were trained to climb towers and they disassembled it and then regalvanized it. And then they reassembled it in its new home right along the swamp. And uh, they used helical anchors to like corkscrews to anchor the tower into its new home. So they didn't have to use a lot of concrete and they didn't have to do a lot of digging so it wouldn't disrupt the environment around it. And not only did they assemble the birding tower, they designed and they built this bird walk, excuse me, boardwalk that takes you to the bird tower. And this tower is open all year round and it's open for anybody to climb. And you can see that it's quite beautiful moving up um, through the canopy and looking out over the, the, um, the county. In our um, 27th year, we've, um, you know, so we've been, we've been in our community for quite a while, almost 30 years, which is a pretty long time for a program to be here. And uh, we've worked very hard to become part of the community. So after working here in New Bern for around, I don't know, 15 years, we, uh, we heard that the community needed a new fire station and they were planning to just build something very simple, pushed back off of the road. And when we heard that, uh, we made the offer and said, please let us build you a fire station. You know, um, you know we think we can, we can do something beautiful that you'll be proud of and, and, and also as a thank you for letting us operate the community. So the New Bern Fire Station it was, is the first civic building that was built in over 100 years in the town of New Bern. And um, as most of our projects are, it's the wood is the primary construction building material. Most of the projects that I've already shown you uh, focus on wood and this project is a pretty, um, it's, ama it's an amazing feat of what a lot of small pieces of wood can do. These are all trusses that the students built off site and then in, um, and then like an, an afternoon we had a boom truck or a crane come and um, you know put them all up in space, up in place. So four students built this fire station and that's what it still operates as. The, the town received a grant and received some money to buy this new fire station, I mean, this new fire truck, and that's where it's housed. Our projects, um, you know, this is, the, this is the grand opening of it. We had a big catfish fry, that's how you eat the catfish here, you fry it, and a big barbecue um, on that evening. Adjacent to the uh, fire station is a town hall. Uh, originally in the fire station, I'll go back an image. So I'm looking at the image with the fire truck. There's a mezzanine at, uh, above the fire truck. You can see that right here. And that was intended to um, be where the community voted and where town hall meetings would be held. But um, the truth is that it was a little too hot in the summer and too cold in the winter for meetings to happen. So um, probably about eight or nine years later, we built a town hall, which is uh, adjacent to the fire station. So in this, this is the fire station here where my cursor's moving. This is a courtyard that we designed. And then here is the new town hall. So uh, 
the town hall was our first or rural studios first experiment with mass timber so the students it was kind of like it's almost like a log cabin in a sense a pretty sophisticated log cabin and um this uh this is a, the the structure um is stacked eight by eight cypress logs which is a, just a, a local kind of lumber here um and they are threaded together those those rods that are coming out of the top are threaded rods and there's also a gasket in between each one but there's no additional insulation in this project or in this building and it stays quite warm in the winter and cool in the summer it's it's um we've since i don't have any images in this presentation but since this project we've done two more mass timber projects and the mass timber is really important to to us and to our research because it's a renewable resource lumber is a renewable resource first of all and it's all grown in our state so it's a building material that we can it's readily available to us and um i think it's pretty significant that just the mass of these um of these timbers does uh it insulates it's also weather protection it's pretty simple i think it's a pretty uh it's in a it's a beautiful rural civic material this mass timber the third um, community building that we've given or built for our town is a new library so the the this bank on the left hand side is was abandoned and it sat empty for many years and had, the roof had started to fall in and um we took it and renovated the shell and then added on in addition to the back to make a new uh, public library and what's i think that probably the biggest contribution besides having a you know a very a peaceful place to find a book or to study and they do all sorts of workshops and artists come to visit here it's actually the first place in our community that has high-speed internet so most of our neighbors operate off of like um, satellite or dial-up internet stills which is very very slow and we that now there's free wi-fi for anybody who wants to use it so it's it's not uncommon this is a, a reading nook for the children to to um to climb into and read a book but it's not uncommon to see people sitting in this courtyard or sitting outside of the library using the internet even when the library is closed so we're very proud of this project and i think that these courtyards the courtyard here and the courtyard that's in between the fire station and the um and the uh the um sorry the town hall i think they're some of the most beautiful spaces that we've ever done and in another exploration of wood like i say we we concentrate on wood because it's a renewable resource like i've mentioned and it's locally available but it's also really easy for our students to work with it's forgiving and um and you can do amazing things with it like this lamella roof structure which is a barrel vault made of really um, a lot of small pieces of wood. And this is, we used this lamella for an animal shelter in our community. So a shelter for stray animals. It has, it's definitely has an agrarian or it feels like it belongs to the land or to an agricultural part. And, um, it's also it's very versatile these are the the cages for the stray animals and again four students i'll keep saying this four students built this particular project um in another um project multi-year project uh, we did over the course of 10 years I think there are six different projects here in Lions Park. So this is the site plan. And what's different about this park is that it's actually built in the city limits of Greensboro, which is the town north of New Bern. So again, um, I think that this is a result, being able to build the city's park is a result 
of having stayed in one location for a long time and to gain the trust of our, um, for the people that live around us. So Lions Park, the first project that was done, um, and these are, all these are all groups of four students, the fifth year students again, uh, were the baseball fields. So baseball fields uh, were already, uh, they were already playing baseball here, but it was not very well organized. And um, as you can see from the site plan, they reoriented all of the um, home plates to where they, uh, they all um, back up to one another. So the parents can watch the older kids playing baseball and then the younger kids can play in what they call Grand Central Station in the, in the center of the parks. So it centralizes all of the, um, all of the activity, which it wasn't like that before. Um, these, these baseball, uh, the backstops, you know, it's just chain link fence like most of us have ever seen on a baseball field before. But instead of stretching this um, chain link fence, these are hung. These panels are hung from the top to bottom. And that's what allows you to be able to get these um, more sculptural shapes. We, uh, we were pretty good at using very common materials in unique ways. So these are road culverts. These are what allows drainage to go underneath a road. And, but we've turned them upright and that they collect rainwater um, to flush the toilets for these restrooms that we also built for the park. So this was a second, um, a second project. The third project at Lions Park is a skate park, which is for skateboarders. It started with, I think it was like $25,000 from a grant. And, um, you know, $25,000 especially doesn't go far now, but it, 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 didn't, it doesn't go far at all when you're thinking about um, trying to design and build a new skate park that's worth anything. So because they had so little money, the students learned, and there they are on the right-hand side of the screen, learned to uh, pour and screed and finish concrete in such a fine way that it's, you know, it's, it's, this skate park would rival any in any big city. So um, this is a pretty well used actual, you know, actually a pretty well used um, part of the park. I think this was opening day. So there are a lot of people here now, but when you go visit, there's usually, um, you know, skateboarders or rollerbladers or all sorts of BMX bikers out on this particular um, skate park. So pretty successful and it's still in great shape all these years later. Um, you know, whereas the skate park, there were no unusual materials there, um, but sometimes we do build with things that, um, you know, maybe it's something that um, you wouldn't normally build with, like these galvanized mint oil barrels. So these barrels carried mint oil, like the plant, um, and I guess mint oil is used for lots of different things, not just chewing gum. And these barrels can only be used once for some reason. So after they're used to haul this oil, they, um, I'm not sure what happens to them, but it, there were lots and lots of them available. And someone offered to um, bring us a couple truckloads of them. And so we decided to build a place gate out of these, um, out of these mint barrels. So there on the left is our first mock-up. Remember I told you that we have to, we prep, that we ask the students to practice everything before they build it in real life. And so they learn to weld. They figured out how to weld the barrels into these lifts and then raise them up on the columns, which are these um, colorful to pipes, the columns that you see. And so now this uh, is part of Lions Park. It's, you know, it's, a, it's an alternative type of playground. It's definitely for older kids, but uh, they, kids really love, and even adults. I've seen a lot of adults run and jump around on the, on the, on the playscape here. 
following the playscape in Lions Park is you might, you may or may have not seen this project before. This is our Boy Scout hut that we built. It, this was a two year project and the students, I think what's interesting, bottom right hand image, or, you know, I've described us using wood in, in you know, many different ways. Well, this is a really unique way of using the wood. The trusses here, you can see, it's kind of hard to describe, but uh, the, 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 the logs, there they are, those are called thinnings, these little trees here. And they are the trees, the small trees that they cut from farmed forests. And uh, they're, they're kind of a waste product. So these particular trees are stacked into the truss and they create a kind of like a, a counterbalance for, to pull the truss tight. I don't think I'm doing a very good job of describing it, but the trees play a role in the structure of the Boy Scout hut. Uh, and it not, I, I haven't mentioned yet, there was another whole project of just the surfaces. So the bioswells, the sidewalks, and the wayfinding throughout this multi-acre park. The last project in Lions Park is a shade pavilion. These four students built four of these, and they are, uh, you know, there's a walking track around the rural studio, I mean, the uh, Lions Park. And so, and it gets very hot here in the summer and there was no place really for anyone to rest in the shade. So these shade structures are sprinkled around the park and they're made of a, it's actually, it's a material called alpolic. It's often used as a, the cladding on large, like, you know, multi-story buildings. It's a sandwich made of a foam and aluminum and the students, um, bent, into, bent the alpolic into these V shapes so they were structural and that's how they're able to um, span between the beams in the sky. So they resemble uh, a tree canopy and the dappled light that comes through, it, you know, they aren't waterproof, they're not meant to protect you from rain, but the dappled light that comes through onto the ground remind you of the light that comes through the canopy of a tree. The latest project that I thought I would throw, that, throw um, these images in, this project is the project that was finished at Rural Studio. This is Horseshoe Farms Courtyard. So I, I'll, I'll stand by my earlier statement that some of our most beautiful projects are the courtyards that we do. This is the old Greensboro Hotel that is now the headquarters for uh, an organization called um, Project Horseshoe Farms. It's just another local nonprofit. And this is the back courtyard for their um, residents and for the people who come to Horseshoe Farms to, um, to use. So it's, it's you know, it's, the plants that are growing now are have already reached the top, so really beautiful. Um, I'm going to transition now um, to uh, the affordable housing part of our study at Rural Studio. But before I do that, I thought I would give you a little bit of background on myself, just so you. Um, can understand where I came from, the work that I did here at the Rural Studio, and then so you can see the work that I do as an associate professor here. So I was a student in this program over 15 years ago, and I have a, uh, my bachelor's degree is from Auburn University, and this is the beautiful space of an abandoned gym um, that we found as students that we were quite inspired by. It was like a, it's like a secret garden. It's in a local abandoned high school. And while that particular, while that building wasn't our project, the, there was one on the property that we focused on. And this is what, this is an old um, gymnate. This is, excuse me, this is an old classroom um, for the Marengo County High School, which is an abandoned building. 
And like the gym that I just showed you that looked like a secret garden, it's a really a beautiful space, but not being used very well. And my project is called the Alabama Rural Heritage Center. And it's a nonprofit that is intended to preserve the rural arts. And they also make pepper jelly, which is a condiment that you eat over cream cheese and eat with crackers. It's a Southern thing. So, you know, I think what's interesting to see is how, you know, your observations, silly ideas, silly observations and drawings turn to ideas, which turn to um, proposals. And then, you know, then you begin your work. So um, the, the outline of the building, this is the old high school building. And what we built is this, uh, we inserted this gift shop into the center of this building. We started by working with an engineer to uh, remove part of the wall here. And we poured these concrete footings and had these steel frames welded and then inserted into place. And, uh, you know, what was important to us when we were building this project was that the building itself, um, we wanted it to retain its, the history or its, it wasn't necessarily a beautiful building, but we conceptually, we didn't want to touch the, touch it. And so we built this, um, you know, this bridge between one, one space and the other, and it's all glass. And the, the client is, it, they fill it with the arts and crafts that are being sold locally. And here's the pepper jelly. So we even made a special place to sell the pepper jelly, right? when you come into the front entrance. So, uh, you know, and you can see they, they sell baskets and all different kinds of arts and crafts. And, and you know, this main, the main, this space was that original image that I showed you that we thought was so beautiful and it is beautiful. And we intended it to be an art gallery. That was our, that was the intention of this, of this space. And then you come back, I found this image on the internet and I like it. This is another one of those lesson learned photographs where we as students thought that this cantilevered edge was so important and that um, we wanted it to seem like this was hovering and not touching and all of these conceptual ideas. But in reality, what was more important to the client was to have a stage for performances. So the stage was built in front of the cantilever, but that's okay because I'm, I'm just pleased that they were using, you know, the, 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 the biggest satisfaction is to see your client using your space in however they see fit. So, but still lesson learned. What's important is the, um, the client is the most important. So, so that's just a quick overview of, uh, of my work as a student. And now that I'm back, I have been back since 2017 and lucky to teach at my, um, you know, the same university that I graduated from. I'm from Alabama, so I am native to the South. And, um, but the third year architecture student, so all of the work that I showed you, all the community projects prior to this, those were done by the fifth year architecture students. Um, so, but the work that I'm gonna show you moving forward is what the uh, third year architecture students do. And throughout the, the rural studios past, the third year students have done, uh, they haven't done just the same type of project. So, uh, over a 10 year period, the third year students actually built out of the same mint oil barrels, this greenhouse for our um, campus. So it's a passively heated and uh, ventilated greenhouse where uh, the barrels, I'll show you here, the barrels that are painted blue are filled with water and they act as a, a thermal mass or a trom wall. And um, so they warm up in the wintertime and radiate their heat back out into the greenhouse at night. And there's also a series of very high windows that, and low windows that ventilate the space in the summertime. I should have put, there is an amazing image of what's growing in the um, greenhouse right now. It's, uh, let's see if I can find it here. I know this is, well, I can't really show you. But um, maybe when we click, but when we take it off a of full screen, I'll show you what it what it looks like. But um, but anyway, 
it. So it's a, like so the third the younger students built this over many years, not just the same group. Many many students helped build this project, and not only did they build the greenhouse part, they also built the storage sheds in the back, and they also built a series of uh, systems to help irrigate the the um, the plants that are grown. So. You can see that water is collected from the roof. It goes into this big gutter and then it's stored into these underground tanks. There's a pump that's run off of a solar panel that pumps the water into this column here. And then through gravity, it feeds the plants water. So third year students do all sorts of projects. And the greenhouse now, plays a pretty important role in the community and the life of the students. We have a full-time farm manager and all of our students uh, work, they have a rotation and they all work in the garden at certain parts of the, you know, from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. to help grow the food. And we have a full-time cook as well, or chef as well, that, um, that cooks the food that we grow. And we all have lunch together every day. So pretty nice. Um, pretty nice part of our life out here that, that the greenhouse has become. So I know I'm just, I'm keeping up with time. I know we started a little bit late and I am, I think I'm doing pretty good for starting late. I, maybe, maybe starting late was good for me because I, um, I'm almost through. We're, we're about to start talking about the affordable housing now. So, okay, I've shown you this slide before and I just want to show it to you again because I want to remind you where Rural Studio started with housing. And it was easier for us when we first started working to build for one family and do a custom home, largely like an architect would operate, like for, you know, for any, for any client. And the, the materials that we used were, you know, alternative. Often we built out of sidewalks and hay bales and carpet tires, all sorts of things that other people would think were garbage. Um, and one of the reasons that we did do that, we, yes, it was, it's interesting. But we also just didn't have a lot of money. Um, we had to build from things that we could find for free. And as we've um, gotten more serious and more rigorous um, at the rural studio, which is quite a bit, we decided that um, building houses, individual houses like that, was not really putting a dent into the housing affordability problem that comes along with um, living in an area that is such a, has such high poverty rates. So there are a lot of people in our area, and there's a lot of people in our country that can um, would benefit from an affordable a uh, house solution that would rival the house trailer. I don't have any images of a house trailer, but these are pre-manufactured homes that get trucked into a site. Um, they don't sit on a real foundation. And instead of appreciating, instead of gaining value over time, they actually lose value over time. And so that's a problem. You know, if you're going to invest in a house, you would rather your property gain um, value instead of lose value. And so to tackle that problem, we started what uh, what is called the 20K House Initiative, or the 20K House Project is what we called it. And it started out by um, $20,000 is the smallest amount of money that the US federal government would loan somebody to um, build a house. It was the smallest loan. So we set out to see what could we build for actually $10,000 in material and $10,000 in labor. Um, so the 20K House is an ongoing research project to develop well-designed, affordable houses that support an industry of home building across the rural South. The project seeks to create dignified houses that make responsible home ownership a possibility for everyone. Uh, so for, so we've been doing this for about 17 years and the first ones that we built were very, were pretty basic. They were durable, they were buildable, they were waterproof, and they were secure, which is really what all housing, those are kind of the essential criteria for all housing. But 
it's evolved um, over those years to part of the criteria or the main criteria there that the houses should have presence. So that means they should um, go beyond the, the essential. They should be dignified. They should provide a sense or foster a sense of community, which often means a nice front porch for people to come visit you or for you to sit outside and watch your community. So all of them have a front porch and a presence on the street. They also contribute to the health and the well-being of our client by providing fresh air, so operable windows, daylight, um, healthy materials, and a sense of comfort that comes along with being at home. When necessary, they should accommodate the client, so through age and accessibility. And the houses should also have a sense of craft. It, um, just because it doesn't cost a lot of money doesn't mean it uh, can't be beautiful. So the houses we've built, the first slide I showed you was a grid of houses. We've built over 25 or 26 different prototypes or iterations of, the, of, of these houses. And uh, my students build, we don't start from scratch. We, the, the, the fifth year students do build a new house each year, a new prototype. But my students work um, in a different way, which is what I'm going to go through. Remember, these students are third year architecture students. So the way I like to describe it is instead of studying housing affordability and building assemblies in a broad manner, we study things in a very deep way. So we, we look at foundations, uh, construction details, we really um, study and learn about our client to make sure that the houses um, are suitable for that particular person that we're building for. So our program of study pushes back on the, on the prototype to make sure that we're making all the right decisions once it's in the real world. So um, we start the semester with what I call um, a sawhorse race. So these are sawhorses, of course. They're just what you use to hold building material or, you know, they're often used on a construction site. And my students design in teams, they get to design and they get to build their sawhorses. There's two iterations. So usually um, the first set of sawhorses are not very strong. And then they go through a set of performance testing. So not only do we get new sawhorses for our job site, Students learn um, a little bit about construction, at least the basics on how to use tools. And we also learn about, um, you know, if, if sawhorses can't hold a stack of lumber like this, then they aren't useful. So we, we talk about the usefulness of the things. And then uh, we, we meet, our, we, then we begin to study the prototypes. And that's what we, that's our main focus. So there are three of the 26 prototypes that we call the product line homes. So these are the most successful one bedroom houses that we've created. And my students really, you know, these are, um, these are just sketch up models where I gave them the set of construction documents and they had to model every piece of lumber, every piece of plywood in order to understand how these buildings are put together. So we start with the basics and how they were done um, before, and then we move to alternatives. So this diagram seems pretty simple, but you can see on the houses on the left, these are all the original foundations, which are built on piers. And then what we were looking at is how does it change the architecture or the space if they're built on a slab? Seems like a silly question, but it's, you know, it's really important. If you look at the middle house, the one that I said was dignified, it really changes the essence of that front porch when it's flat on the ground. Um, so we make, we test alternative assemblies, and, but we make sure they're the right thing for the, for, the, um, for the house or for the architecture first. We draw at full scale a lot at Rural Studio. Um, we, construction, Details, So you can't really see what we're looking at, but those are full scale building sections of the house that my students are designing. So I wanted them to understand the magnitude of, you know, what they were building. And so we do that through drawing um, if we can't do a mock up. 
So we have a lot of fun learning about how buildings go together also. So here's an example of a full scale building section. It's a great way, if you've never had a student draw this way, it's a really great way for them to understand how buildings go together. Um, we always work together. So I think the hardest part of my job is to get this, a group of students like this, get 16 minds on the same page and to agree on what we build. We don't build, we don't, whatever we build, we don't vote on it. And um, I don't pick and I don't do the design work. The students do all the design work and we come to consensus of what's the right direction through discussion and through lots and lots of drawing and categorization and discussion of ideas. And they do the same types of drawings that you would in any other architecture school. And then when we get to a certain point, we create, uh, I mean, we create presentations to give to our client and let them um, and inform them on the progress and to give them, let them give some feedback on the direction that we're headed. We also get feedback from um, other outside guests in multiple ways. We do series drawings, we do construction documents, we study details, we do scheduling, we do budgeting. This is a uh, pull planning session. This is how I have my students work on schedules together and with sticky notes, pretty simple, but it works. And then we get out there and do it. So we, um, this is the first house that I built for a client named Re. Um, we, um, we, the rural studio had never built an elevated slab, which is not a new construction type. It's just a concrete block foundation that's infilled with dirt and gravel, and then you pour a slab on top. It's nothing revolutionary, but it was, um, it, it's new for us. So it gives the houses that sense of dignity that I was talking about, but with a lower foundation that um, is more durable than the peers. Um, so not only, you know, I think the, for me, the biggest lesson that my students learn is how to work with a client and how to understand all the different ways that people live. You know, that no one, no one is the same and that everyone deserves the same amount of respect and um, why dignity is important. So my students do a series of drawings and this is one of the other, um, you know, the initial uh, assignments that we do where I have them very meticulously measure and then render and draft and render the client's existing home. So this is Ree's trailer that she lived in for over um, 40 years. And it's obviously, she needs a new home. That's why we're building her one. But what I want the students to understand is how much love Re gave this building and that it, she and that building deserves um, all of our respect. So I think that when you ask a student to do a very careful, loving drawing on a piece of very expensive paper, that some of the care that they give the drawing, um, you know, they internalize it and become to care for the client. Just a theory that I have. So I ask all the students to not draw it as a photograph, but to edit it and to pick out something unique or special about the client. So you might ask, why did this person draw the pickup truck? Well, obviously um, to our client, her pickup truck is very important. She pays for a personalized license plate that says my yo, it's like my Toyota every year. And also, um, uh, she also has bad knees. She can't walk very far. So she likes to park her truck right up front. And I'll show you how that affected the design in just a minute. I also have the students um, catalog and draw each of the belongings of our student, of our own, of our clients. And that helps um, them to understand space requirements in the new house. So we can understand what furniture she'll be bringing over. Um, so this is Re inside of her new home. And Re, um, Re, uh, she asked for a ramp. So 
And she also lives next door to her sister, which is another 20K house. So we altered the front porch of one of the product line homes to accommodate her mobility requirements and to offer up, um, you know, an extension to her sister's house next door. And I wish the pickup truck were photographed, but right on this big concrete pad, that was her old driveway because her old trailer sat right here. And she just parks her truck right there so she can easily get in. So um, I think the students learned a lot about re from that particular drawing. Our My latest client that I just finished building a house for is a really sweet lady named Ophelia Reed. She just moved into her house this weekend. She was born in New Bern and lived there for 50 years. And when we met um, Ophelia, one of her sons, her grown sons were living with her and she slept in, or sleeps in the living room, like where the television is. And um, you might think that that doesn't sound normal, but she really likes it because it's the center of the activity. It's where the television is. And she has this really beautiful day bed that um, um, it's just like a, it's a couch during the day and it's a bed during at the night. And so this drawing that the students did, these are, it's a floor plan and rendered interior elevations highlight, you know, like they, they, it talks about this day bed and her, um, desire to keep sleeping in the day bed, not in, in a bedroom. So this is the catalog of all the furniture that's in her current house and then what was going into the new house. These are renderings. Uh, it's a drawing that a student did, pretty amazing, of the existing house. And I think, you know, this one talks about technology and connectivity. Even when you live in a rural place, um, you are still have you know television antennas and satellite dishes and internet and all of the things that everybody else has so in the last, so this uh you know i think what i want you to see is i i said that we take the product line homes and we modify it to suit the client and to suit the site and to suit whatever um building um assemblies we want to explore so on the left is the original floor plan for Joanne, we call it Joanne's house. And you can see on the right, we modified it. We, changed, we enlarged it just a little bit and we added in room here for um, this uh, sleeping nook, which is for Ophelia's day bed, but it could be universally, it could be used for a home office or someone for, if you, if you have a, um, you know, someone in your family that needs a place to stay for a, a longer period of time. We have this little extra space here that we call the quarter bedroom. Um, we also enlarged the bathroom to meet federal housing standard size requirements and um, some other minor things. So in this last image, this is, this is Ophelia's house. You can see that it's similar to Ree's house, which is in the middle. And they're all cousins of um, Joanne's house, which was the first one. So first one's Joanne, Reese, and Ophelia's. So uh, it's a really unique experience for our students to be able to build in it with different versions to study different aspects of the house. So, um, and then my last little bit before I close out, uh, you guys have been patient and listening for a long time. Um, our, our newest segment of the Rural Studio is called the Front Porch Initiative. So their um, motto or their, you know, they believe that everyone deserves good design. And the Front Porch Initiative aims to develop a scalable, agile, and resilient delivery process for beautiful, well-designed, high-performance homes titled as real property while supporting an industry of home building in under-resourced rural communities. So that uh, mission statement sounds quite a bit like the 20K project mission statement, but what's different is that the Front Porch Initiative, this is our new research and development office. So um, our colleagues that work in this office are pushing these houses that the students designed out into the real world. So this is another version of the other three houses I showed you built in Nashville, Tennessee. And this house is a commercially available. Someone will buy this house and have a real mortgage, which will begin building wealth for them. So 
um, the rules, the student work at Rural Studio is really making a regional impact on the housing affordability problem that we have in our area. So um, you can see these are all, they're very similar to those product line homes. Okay, I'm wrapping up. Um, you know, I, I, I won't be long winded. I think that uh, all I will say is that I'm proud and we all are that we work here to be training and educating the next generation of designers and architects. And we hope that through this experience of studying in rural West Alabama, working with real clients and actually learning how to put the buildings together that they design, that they will be, you know, become more empathetic, they will become more um, conscious and just be, uh, you know, um, and to be, to be a citizen architect is what we call it. An architect who, uh, you know, works for everyone, whose goal is to make everyone's life more beautiful and more useful. And um, so we're um, here in Alabama. We have books if you've never seen them. Um, maybe they're in your library. You can buy them on Amazon. I don't think they're in Portuguese or French, but English. And um, and we always want to invite you to come see us. So if you're ever in the U.S. or if you're in and if you find your way to Alabama, we are more than happy to show you around to show you our work. And uh, at the end of each spring semester, sometime at the end of April. We have a big celebration and that's what this image is. We call it pig roast where we do a um, big barbecue. And I know um, this picture is uh, before the, um, the, the pandemic. So this year's pig roast will be a little bit different. I'm, I'm not sure what that'll mean for us in, um, in April, but we hope that things will be on the right track and that we'll be able to invite the clients and the families of our students to celebrate their hard work. So. Um, please come and visit if you are ever in our neck of the woods. And thank you very much for inviting me to participate in your program today. Thank you so much, Emily. This was really wonderful and very inspiring. Oh, good. <laughs> we have quite a lot of questions, actually. Okay. You ready? Good. I also have a lot of questions, but I will go last let's see so i don't know if i should i will read the questions in portuguese and maybe guilherme can translate them to you guilherme tudo ok aí você ainda aguenta mais um pouquinho i can't hear him but <laughs> oh, i don't hear him either Okay, uh, should I go to the English session or to the Portuguese one? Oh, this I one? don't, I, I really don't. Okay, know. well. No. Guilherme, você, será que você entra com a gente na mesma sessão? Na mesma, no mesmo canal? No, okay, anyway, if you can't hear him, I, I can translate it. É, primeira pergunta do Chico Barros, que agradece a Emily pela maravilhosa apresentação falando como que o, o Rural Studio influenciou é, a FAO, USP e o IAL também, em São Carlos, né? desde o início, que, que eles têm acompanhado desde o início. E a pergunta é se nos Estados Unidos o Rural Studio teve algum impacto em outras escolas, se outras escolas, em função dessa experiência, transformaram os seus métodos de ensino. Yes, so um, I hear the question is um, that uh, has, do I believe that what the Rural Studio is doing, has it impacted the educational models of other schools? So first of all, you're welcome. I'm happy to be here. Um, thank you for thanking me. And uh, yes, I mean, I would say so. You know, when Rural Studio started back in the early 1990s, I, I'm not going to say we were the first school to ever um, provide a hands-on experience to our architecture, you know, to architecture students, because even before Rural Studio, there were professors at Auburn who were doing, you know, design build in a, in a different way. But, um, but 
in the almost 30 years that Rural Studio has um, been doing what we do, I would say that most architecture schools now do have some sort of design build component. They, no two design build programs are alike. They are so unique to the community that you're building, you know, uh, funding, it's unique to uh, how your approvals process for like building things in a city. You know, we, we actually don't have a, a building permitting office. And so it's up to us to be responsible, but we don't have to wait on permitting. Um, so there are a lot of things that make Rural Studio possible that would make, you know, that, that don't, um, that would make things, that make us unique. So yeah, I mean, yes, I, I, you know, I'm familiar with, I think some of, at the University of um, Colorado in Denver, the Colorado Building Workshop, they're doing amazing work right now, design build work. Tulane has a design build program led by a really amazing woman. Her name is Emily also, um, that's in New Orleans. Every, you know, most architecture, you know, University of Virginia had a program for a long time. All, I think that most have some component of it. I think the challenge, again, is um, another, one of the biggest challenges that you have to have a champion it's a, it is not like normal architecture school. You do, you spend a lot more time planning. Um, things aren't, um, sometimes things don't go as planned because of weather. And you usually have to have a couple professors or a professor who really want to see that through. So often the design build programs are individually based on a particular person teaching in that program. So that makes them challenging sometimes, but, um, but yes, it has, I, I would say that design build education is a common, it's common in the U.S. as part of an architecture student's education these days. Great, thank you, Emily. So this one, the second one is actually written in, in English. Huh. It's... <laughs> Werner Monteiro, he asks, thank, oh, he says, thank you, Emily, for sharing such, such interesting projects and processes. How important to you is it to build full scale, full scale mockups as a decision making tool? And how does uh, it dialogue with digital tools? Então, é, tá, ele agradece a Emily pelo compartilhamento e pergunta. Qual é a importância de fazer essas maquetes em escala um para um, como um, né, uma ferramenta de decisão e como que as ferramentas digitais entram em diálogo com esse processo? So, um, okay, what the question I heard was how important are full scale mockups, and then what it, but for making decisions, and then how do digital tools help us make decisions as well? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the extents that we go to to have the students even first draw at full scale shows that the full scale mock-up is often very important. Rarely when you're design, designing something for the first time, well, first of all, these are students who um, have very little design experience at all, very little with any construction experience. So usually the first thing that they make is not very refined, doesn't work very well. So for all of our community projects that Andrew leads, uh, we do full-scale mock-ups actually in the backyard of our, um, on our campus. So the students are able to test the, their ideas. And then we have lots of conversations about what's working, what's not. And then we modify those mock-ups, you know, on our, in our, on our own property. And then um, after, after quite an extensive refinement process, are they actually allowed to, you know, spend the money and build in the community? For my students, um, because wood frame construction, stick frame construction that we use is, it's pretty forgiving and pretty common and we're working in a system. Um, my method usually is to just get out there and try it, you know, and if we make a mistake, we adjust it and we change it because it's it's pretty easy to do that with lumber and with wood. 
Um, now we do a, a lot of drawing and yes, some of it is, um, you know, the students have access to all the same digital tools that they would on main campus. Um, we use them, you know, truthfully, the, we still use a lot of two-dimensional, we still use AutoCAD and they use Revit some and they model their ideas to be able to study the space in different, you know, 3D programs. Um, but we, we just actually, um, we've had our first experience with a, a LIDAR scan with like a three-dimensional point scan um, just this year. We had an expert come out to scan um, some remnants of a project that we are going to add on to. And so I think more and more we'll be, we'll use the digital tools available to us, but that's only after they learn the basic things that we, you know, drawing mock-ups and basic, basic skills first, so. Okay. And this is a question from Saskia Obata. Adorável a apresentação de projetos realizados, cursar, aprender no fazer e na transformação dos espaços. Assim, gostaria de saber, de modo específico, como são patrocinados ou como estão incluídos os profissionais, engenheiros e colaboradores tecnológicos. Eles são voluntários ou são docentes eh, vinculados ao curso? Hum. Okay, I understand the question is talking about how do we either pay or the engineers and the other consultants that we work with, do we pay them or are they um, associated with our university? And maybe some people might want to know about um, how the projects are paid for as well. That might have been in that question. I'll start with how the projects are paid for. Uh, we operate off of um, grants and small donations. So we do have a, um, we do have a development officer at our main campus who helps write grants and, um, uh, and they solicit donations from different organizations. So each year we start, um, you know, my, I'm not given, but my budget is about $40,000 to build a house. And that's what I, you know, am able to expect each year. And the other projects, um, the community projects, usually the community organization that we're working with, they already have some money or they have access to some money. And then they put maybe $30,000 in, we'll match it with another $30,000. And then the students are really, really good at getting material donations. So they call companies and ask for free materials. And usually, um, are pretty successful. So one project, I didn't show it, but those students, um, you know, they got around $70,000 worth of material donations by just making phone calls. So that's pretty good. As far as our, um, uh, the engineers that we work with, we do have, uh, we pay our visitors, you know, we have code consultants, we have engineers, landscape architects, we have um, just other architects that come to give us knowledge and to do reviews. We pay for, I think we pay them sometimes a small stipend for their time while they're there for the couple days. We pay for their travel and their room and board. But that's, you know, usually it, it's, it's essentially, it's, um, it's a donate, they're making a donation to us through their time and knowledge. We do, and we use a lot of outside consultants. Our engineer is, um, some is a man from Chicago and but we also use um, our we use the landscape architecture faculty they've been a great asset to us so they come and visit and they're right in our same you know our same college so um, it's a it's a variety but a, a lot of it is that these folks have been coming for so long they're like friends of ours so we look forward to having them come down to do reviews and um, that's, uh, but that's, it's more casual than it is, um, than it, they're, they're not really on our payroll, you know, so. <laughs> uh, fine. 
Um, ok, Saskia also says, eu estou aqui em dúvida, eu leio, tenho que ler em português, né? Yes, I have to read it in Portuguese. So, um exemplo importante, dado como um programa que evolui tem a idade que tem é marcante. A ah, yes, this was one is about the church. A construção da igreja foi, foi dada e não requerida pela comunidade é interessante em termos de recursos que podem ser retrofitados, né? ou seja, reformulados para no novos usos. Assim, e dentro do que é desempenho e ciclo de vida completo de projetos e produtos, a pergunta é se esse projeto foi retomado depois para estudos. Há exemplos de acompanhamento de ciclo de vida e como se dá o ensino aos clientes do ciclo de vida e maior sustentabilidade não somente nas versões de casas como mostrado. Ah, yes, I think... It's, it's a bit confusing here, but it's about the approach to the clients in all the other projects, not only the housing projects, and also this question about the life cycle of the church in particular, but also the other buildings. Okay. Which, can you tell me which church, the, did I, the, um, The chap, the dirt chapel, the rammed earth chapel, or the first church I showed. Which church was it that? The, it we was the first uh, because you 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 showed this this first church. Oh, down. And yes, and telling that in fact the clients hadn't asked for it, mm -hmm. and that then you learned about it. Right. But I mean, the question is, what did you do about this building later on? Is it, mm -hmm. is it just a ruin or? Right, right. Yeah, anything to change We've, it or to use it? We, uh, good question. So um, I'll address life cycle. Um, I'll, I'll talk about how we, um, how we study life cycle now. And I'll also talk about how we maintain some of our older projects um, uh, also. So, you know, in the last, I would say five or six years, we have gotten quite a bit better at um, going back and revisiting and kind of uh, l looking. We always, we, we have always done that, but especially with our housing affordability, where the projects in the, the, the housing projects, we've even gone so far to embed sensors into the walls to find out the energy consumption to really confirm our, um, to be able to confirm what we're saying, how these buildings perform, we want to be able to confirm that. And that's another part of the front porch initiatives work as well. So in, in the housing realm, we're quite serious about understanding the full cost for living in one of our buildings. And that is, uh, you know, what it costs to operate them after we, you know, after someone lives in them. So I think we have got a good handle on that. We're doing well. Um, for some of our older projects that, you know, we didn't quite get the details right and things are um, in bad shape. The Glass Chapel has been, it was redone several times. You know, we fixed the wind, you know, we, we go out, we have a time period um, at the beginning of each semester, we call it neck down. So from your neck down, which means you're not having to think to do the work. It's not really true that you're not thinking, but It's just, um, it's our time to go back to our older projects and to repair them if they're broken and to give the students more hands-on knowledge about how to fix the things that we didn't quite get right. So um, the glass chapel has been repaired. I wouldn't say that it's in perfect, I mean, I won't, I, I'll be honest, it's not in perfect condition now and it's not really used um, how we ever expected, but it's stable, you know, now. Um, And, but I think the more successful project that we've just renovated was Perry Lakes Park. Those, that's the bathrooms and the pavilion and the birding tower. We just replaced all of the platforms going up the birding tower just this year. We replaced all of the boardwalk, the boards in the boardwalk. Um, the bathrooms, we just repaired all of them. And the pavilion is actually has some, some bigger issues that we're going to take care of in the, in the 
can probably make another project out of it. So as we've, you know, we've been around for 30 years, some of our projects are um, need a little help and we, we do go back to, to, to visit them and to repair them. Yeah, Emily, there many people are saying how incredible this whole program is and congratulations, thank you so much for many, many people here in the chat and in YouTube. But, and some questions are, I, I think you have already answered uh, concerning the, how this whole program is, is, is financed mm -hmm. or supported by the university. I, I think you have told us already. And then there, here is another question about um, if there is any, or if there there are any criteria to select the families that you will right. provide with new houses. É, agora falei em inglês com ela, mas está escrito aqui no chat a pergunta da Akemi, tá rara se existe algum critério de seleção para o atendimento às famílias ou comunidades para a reali realização das atividades. Ok. Uh, yeah, no, a, a lot of people ask this question. And um, I'm actually going through this process right now to try to find my client. We've been going through it for a while, actually. It's actually... The, my least favorite part of the job. I know that sounds terrible, but um, it feels like I'm playing God in some sense, like who gets a house, you know, and that's really not, I mean, I'm an architect. I, this is not, this is not my area of expertise, but the process is pretty, it's um, pretty casual, you know, the, and the requirements are that um, someone needs to own their property, which is because we can't buy land as a state institution. We can buy materials with the money that's donated to us. And so the person must uh, own their own land. I build one bedroom houses. So um, my client should only, can only require a one bedroom house. And um, most of the time, the, the only other, you know, it's nice if they have a working septic system, but that's not a, a real requirement. And it's really that does this person, um, are they okay with having all of these students measuring their couches and in their, you know, like you saw the drawings that I have them do. It's pretty, it's not invasive, but it is pretty, you have to be comfortable with us in your business for nine months. Um, but it's just a simple form that people call in and fill out or, um, and you know, the other thing is that they have to be within driving distance of where we work. So I like to be right local. I like to be within about five or six miles. So there's actually not that many people, um, not as many people as you might think, but it's pretty, it's a, it's a, an exciting process when you finally find your client, but the process to get there, to talk to people and to raise their hopes about a house and then for not, for you to not be able to do it is pretty, that's pretty hard work, I think. Um, but uh, it's just not something I expected to have to do as an architecture professor, but, but we get, we do it, we get through it, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. So here's still another question about, I don't know if you have the same rules in the United <laughs> States, but here there has to be someone technically responsible for any design and also mm -hmm. any building, which would be someone, uh, who is already uh, graduate and, and has kind of the professional credentials. Mm -hmm. And the question here is who has the technical responsibility for your projects or for the designs and the building sites? I, I would actually, uh, maybe there is another question I was wondering about, have you any ins insurance for the students? Mm -hmm. Sure. If, for any accidents or whatever may happen to them? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'll, um, I'll answer the insurance question that you have first. So the question is, do we, does the university provide, what kind of insurance do we have for accidents? Uh, well, we're, you know, uh, because we're a unit, uh, a university unit, it's just like how the, vet, the veterinary school, they um, have their students practice 
just like medical school where medical students go into a hospital and practice, our university sees what we're doing as just another practice. So they provide, they, that's how we're allowed to do what we do. It's just like a medical student or a nursing student going to a hospital and, um, mm -hmm. and practicing medicine. So it's the same insurance that covers them. So, um, so that's how we're allowed, that's how we operate in the university system. Uh, the next question was the technical oversight. So, well, there's, there's two parts to that, I would say. Um, first of all, you know, I'm technically responsible. My, you know, all of the, the advisors, you know, and the consultants that we come, all of these individuals know very well what's going on with the project. So they're all technically responsible for that. Now, legally in our country, well, it's different in every state, but buildings of a certain size or certain square footage don't require a registered architect. So we never, sounds like we're cheating, but we're really not. We're just, um, we're just make, the, the question we always ask ourselves is if we need it, if the building is so big or it goes beyond um, what we're capable of doing, then should we be doing it? So anything that a registered architect should be doing, we do, we just don't, we don't go into that realm. That doesn't mean that we don't provide the same oversight. We just don't go as large. Um, I think it's like 3,800 square feet or something like that. So if it's below that, then um, really anybody can design it, believe it or not. And houses, most houses, unless they get to be a really big house, you don't need a registered architect for, believe it or not. So um, sounds like we're, we're not really, we're not cheating. We're just operating at a much smaller scale than what would bump us up into the kind of legally binding architecture stamp drawings that some. Yeah, that, that's interesting to know because it's, it's the same here. You can build something, I think till 40 square meters, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And you are not in competition with mm -mm. architectural offices or whatever. Right. right. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, Emily, I, I would just maybe to finish, let's see if there's... No, everybody is saying that it's so inspiring and that they want to visit you. <laughs> So one. And there is a, ah, still another question. And this is also from uh, our colleague, Clésio Magalhães, who is one of the organizers also. And it, it's almost was, it was my question mm -hmm. in a way, because you, you told us about uh, technical consultancy and engineers and so on. But what about the craftsmanship? Mm -hmm. uh, what about the skills and know-how that people actually need to do this kind of, of, of work and, and put things together? And is there anyone who, who teaches the student how to, how to do things actually? Because this is not a, so, such a simple task. Um, a lot of, no, that's a good question. You know, on a on the the paper answer or the the official, you know, one of the answers is that our students, my students, all the young students take a wood shop class when they're in their third year of study. So they learn the basic, um, they learn the very basics of woodworking and all of the tools. Uh, you know, my knowledge, a lot of it's just learned um, uh, in on in the field. Like, you know, I know how to build a stick frame house, so I'm. The, the technical knowledge, I'm, I'm the site supervisor for my students. So I'm there, we, we do a lot of drawing, a lot of prep work, and then we do a lot of, you know, on site putting things together and then redoing. So a lot of the technical, like a lot of the trades or the craftsmanship is trial and error through those mock-ups as well. But on special things like maybe welding or, um, when um, something unique comes, we, we have, we also have trades people that help us with, um, with teaching the students how to do like certain, you know, the, those tasks. But my students do all the plumbing. We do the electrical. We learn a lot from books. Um, we learn a lot from YouTube videos. You know, <laughs> yeah. we, 
we cobble together uh, some some knowledge, but um, a lot I would say a lot of it is self-taught and trial and error in some ways. It's kind of the nice thing about building. You can practice and then you do the real thing and then it just takes time, so. Mm -hmm. So people, I think we have to finish now because Malu, qual é a ordem? Ah, oh. A gente imaginou ficar um pouco mais, né? Pois é, mas já passou do, do, do um pouco atraso, mais, né? que era até as quatro. No lucro ainda. É... Não, ok. O que você... É. A gente pode encerrar, né? Eu acho que, acho que já está é. muito bem, né? Eita, peraí. Yes, Emily, I think we have to finish because... Yes, we... Yes, yes. And... This was eu sempre really, quero really... terminar, né? Primeiro, terminar, terminar. Eu quero começar, né? Continuar, vamos continuar, porque está sendo uma rasca só. É... Bora well, lá, terminar, people, né? If, if, uh, if people have any other questions, they're welcome to email me. You can give them my email address or you can find me on our website. So here, I'll put in, I'm sure you can find us on the internet because you know, we're not hard to find, but we have an awesome new website. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's, there we go. That's pretty good. You can find me there. Oh, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Okay, Emily, so thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, good luck on the rest of your, um, on your uh, program. So thank you for inviting us and thank you for listening to me talk about this program. <laughs> We, I, I think you will have a lot of visitors in the Good. next year, probably. Please. Bring your students. <laughs> yeah, fine. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Obrigada a todo mundo, viu, gente, por ouvir. Acho que a gente encerra por aqui, então. Malu, você, a gente fecha? Como é que Vamos é? fechar, então. Agradeço. Tá thank bem. you, family. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. It was really Hi. amazing to think you the all the things you you did all this year and thank you very much and now i'm going to speak in portuguese obrigado <laughs> gente pela presença e a gente começa a mesa 2 de no horário que tá mantém na horário né rita não era 6 era 4 e meia né é, vamos dar o um intervalo de 10 minutos para a gente organizar a próxima mesa e a gente volta pode ser pode Então, a gente vai permanecer nesse, nesse link né, do, do, do Zoom, desculpa, já estou meio... E... Mas a gente dá um intervalo, se vocês quiserem sair, ou fechar, só fechar o áudio e a câmera, e a gente agradece, mas daqui a pouco a gente volta para mais uma rodada de discussão, okay. uma mesa. Obrigada, Silvia, Beleza. queria agradecer Tchau, a você. Tchau, gente. Obrigada, Guilherme, pela tradução, é. e obrigada, Lara, que ficou no, no apoio. Obrigada a todos que participaram e fizeram perguntas. Obrigada a todo mundo que está assistindo também no, no YouTube, né? Pelo, e pedimos desculpas pelo início atravancado, mas sabe como é, né? Quem sabe, sabe faz ao vivo, né? <risos> como a gente tá... O ao vivo tem esses problemas, gente. Então, eu agradeço muito. Agradeço a todos. Bora lá. Obrigada. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Bye, Bye. See you. You can be... Come to here to Brazil. Oh, I, I saw the links. I'll pop in maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh -huh.